Um, now, of course, I need to get back to where I was. There we go. I'm hoping that it's going to go and share any minute. Please share. Yep, that's sharing. Lovely. Excellent. Um, right, let me just switch on my camera so that you can I can actually say a proper hello to everybody. Hello, so I'm Jane Fitzgerald. I'm a lecturer in uh, health informatics and evidence-based practice at the University of Central Lancashire. Um, my big passion now, and has been for a long time, I suppose, is digital teaching, how we do it and why we do it. And I am one of those people, I've used computers in all their forms since 1982. I was very blessed to get a job um, working with a company um, that were very, very forward thinking um, all, all those years back. Um, so I've used so many different types of software over the years, um, but I've never had any formal training in any of them. So I have picked bits up and I've learned bits here and there. And whilst that stood me in good stead, there have been times when I've gone, I'm probably using 10% of what this software can do and I need to be learning more about it. And I think over the last year, what's happened is that I've looked far more in depth at the software that we use um, and started to use far more of it than I have probably ever used before. So that's where I'm coming from. I'm gonna stop my camera now so that I can go through my presentation and not, yeah. Call, call to everybody to be looking at my flapping hands and, and, and things in just a moment. So I've described who I am. Part of my role at UCLan is uh, I'm a DigiLearn champion and most of you, I hope by now, will have heard of the DigiLearn sector. But I'm also a digital coach. So I spend a part of my role at the university actually helping others to learn about all those other bits of, soft, uh, of the software that they don't already use. I'm a Microsoft Innovative Educator Expert, and I'm just about to apply for my third year, and I'm also a Microsoft Certified Educator. And that's one of those things where you think, oh, but what it has done for me, both of those things, is to make me look at what I'm learning and what I'm doing with it and why I'm doing that. So that's where I, I am at right now. So when we moved, OK, I think it's reformatted things slightly as, as, as we copied them over to Blackboard. So my apologies if, if the formatting isn't perfect. We really have had over the last year two different cohorts of students. So the first cohort, when we all went into lockdown last March, I don't know about everybody else, but we got basically um, a week's notice that this was going to happen. Fortunately for us, we'd had the DigiLearn program within the university anyway. So lots of people had at least got some basics of Microsoft Teams and, and how to use at least some of what that could do to start teaching students remotely. I don't like to say online, I like to say remotely because all of my work with the students is face to face, but through a screen. So that's remote. So it's not necessarily online. And today I'm not gonna particularly talk about asynchronous or synchronous. I'm talking about the, the, the stuff that I do with my students face to face through a screen every day. So the first set of students that were, were just thrown from having, you know, been in the classroom um, to suddenly it being online. So they'd had some teaching in the classroom. They were largely already in established groups. We all know what it's like. The students come in and they sit and they get used to each other and they sit together forever after, unless you mix things up a bit, which the students hate, but it's sometimes a good idea. Most of them were fairly confident with some of the technology that we've been using. So I had already been using, for example, Teams and the class notebook with them. I'd already used VVox with them. So, so that was a bit easier for them. But that's very different using it in the classroom with somebody telling them and making what to do and, sh and making sure that they were doing the right thing to being on their own, the other side of the screen and not necessarily being able to follow everything easily. 
And then that absolute assumption that they were going to be losing out because they weren't in the classroom, they were going to be losing out. And then we moved to the second group of students um, in September and they'd had no classroom teaching at all. They'd never met each other or that they'd only met perhaps one or other two, two, two other people. So there was no or very minimal peer support available to them. They were largely terrified of the technology. They, ha they hadn't got a clue. And a lot of my students tend to be a bit older, shall we say. So they are, they are master's students or they're returning um, to studying after a gap. So they, they didn't really understand the technology. Um, and, and I think it's a really interesting thing. We all assume that our millennials know lots about technology, or if they don't, at least they're not scared of it. And that has absolutely not been my experience. So they might know how, you know what to do with Facebook book or, or Twitter or all those other apps that they use. They might know how their video games work, World of Warcraft, whatever that they're well into all of those, perfectly comfortable, but give them something that is um, more formal, shall we say, and they they are as flummoxed as everybody else. So, I, and I think that's a really interesting thing and something that I know at UCLan, and I'm sure you are all doing the same thing, we're working really hard at trying to upskill those students now. And one of the things which has been really, really lovely for us is we use Microsoft Teams and Microsoft Teams is being rolled out across the NHS. So my students who tend to be um, healthcare related, they are all, they, they leave us knowing more about Teams than anybody in their NHS trust is ever going to be able to teach them. So that, that's great. But also they're coming to us and having no idea what to expect. So, you know, they arrive at the, the first teaching session and they think that it's either just going to be a recorded PowerPoint or I'm just going to be sitting there talking at them. And then when you say, right, I want you to do an activity now, and they are completely panicked. So we, we have those different groups. Click the wrong button. There we go. So with cohort one, my, my, my original aim was just really to create a, something as close as possible to the classroom experience. So I wanted them to feel as if everything was continuing as normal. They were just in an individual space instead of a class space. It needed to be seamless because these were students who weren't used to moving around between different pieces of technology. So it needed to be seamless um, so that everything was contained within one space and we weren't making them go to lots of other places. And it needed to be interesting. You know, I'm one of those people, if you could see me now, my hands are going and I'm moving around. Um, I wanted it to be as interesting for them as if they were in the classroom so that they didn't feel as if they were move, losing out. Then we have cohort two. And they were, in fact, exactly the same. I wanted to be as close to the classroom experience as possible. It needed to be seamless and it needs to be interesting. And, and it, there's nothing worse. We've all been in meetings where we just sit there and go, shoot me now. Or this is two hours of my life that I'm never going to get back. So it's, it's got to be interesting to hold them because we can't see. Students might be logging in and then disappearing off the minute they get bored. Or they might be on their phones. And I find it really interesting with the students with who've got their webcams on. They forget the webcams on. And I've seen a student, you know, actually watching an event from bed and then just disappearing off to obviously go, go and get dressed and come back. <laughs> so, you know, they, they, they do they do all sorts of things when they're not. They obviously don't realise that we're watching. But I think with cohort two um, and my first word for this was simple. And I thought, no, actually, that that's not the right word. It needs to be straightforward. It needs to be something that we can explain to the students in words of one syllable so that they can understand it. And I think that um, we sometimes forget that what we know really well, and I was I was trying to, to do something today that I, I was gonna get you guys to do some activities. And I realized that I was 
just not going to get it working the way I wanted it to and be able to explain to you all what it was I wanted you to do. So I sort of backed off of that, but it was a salutary lesson, I have to say. So it needs to be, we need to be able to explain it and they need to be able to follow exactly what we're doing. And what I have found is it doesn't matter if you've done a fabulous video in advance of the module, say, watch this so that you know that this is what this is how we're going to be doing things because students don't or if they do they don't remember it because when it comes to actually doing things live you know i've just had our our, our lovely host here having to explain to me in words of one syllable which buttons to press because i'm going i can't see it i can't see it where, where, where's this button because things are not necessarily in the same place depending on on the different setups that people have so that was my those, those are my main things. Um, so those are my drivers, if you like, for the, the way that I have developed things. So the first thing I say, we use Microsoft Teams, and my apologies to those of you who are really, really up to speed um, with, with Teams. Not everybody uses it, um, and I, but I think what I'm trying to do now is say, you know, you might not use Teams, or you might use Teams exclusively, but this is my take on it, and this is why I do these things. So the very first thing I've done with, with the students is to set up um, private groups. So these channels here have the, the students in them. The other students cannot even see that those groups exist. So group A can't see B, C, D, E, F, and so on. So that's their, their little private space. That's just for them. Now, within those groups, they can meet, they can, they could, they can just post messages to each other if, if that's what they want to do. They can meet in exactly the same way as we are. So they, they can webcam, they can talk. And I get them to use that function when, when they're doing activities. So they will leave me. They will go off to these groups and they will work within those groups exclusively. Now, all of these platforms have um, breakout rooms, which are fine, depending on what it is that you're doing. I wanted something more permanent. I wanted something where the students wouldn't have to go off and find the relevant meeting to look at the relevant chat. I wanted everything to be in one place where they could easily find it. So that's why I use the private channels rather than breakout rooms. And I was saying before everybody joins that I was going to do an activity um, and get you all to go off into breakout rooms. And I thought, but I don't use breakout rooms and I have a really, I think, a really good reason as to why I don't use them. Um, so I decided not to do that. So I'm afraid you are going to be sitting largely and just listening to me talk. So we, we have those. Um, now, those students stay in those groups for the duration of the module. And that means over time, we start to they, they start to build up the, those networks and, and that real peer support. And I was quite quite chuffed recently to have a student contact me to say, I've been put in a different group, not, not with the same people on another module. Is there anything you can do about it? And of course, there wasn't anything I could do about it. But I have now talked to um, the other module leader. And in fact, we, we've talked together as a course team now. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep those students um, in the same groups throughout the course. So for the whole year, they will be in the same group. So those peer support network that will, will get stronger and stronger and stronger over time. You know, I, I know that pedagogically, but perhaps we should do some mixing up. But as like I said before, the students hate it. And I think the mixing up of those groups is is manageable in the classroom. It gets much, much more difficult and much messier when you're trying to manage that whole process online. Now, setting these channels up does take a little bit of time. You need to decide how many groups you need. Um, and I work, everything that I do, all the activities that I do, I do in sixes now. Oh, here we go. How did you allocate the groups at the start of the year? Yes. So um, 
I first of all work out how many activities I have and I break those down into sixes. So I need six groups for each activity. If I've got gazillions of students, then I might have to have two groups because I think a group of six or eight is um, is probably optimal. I think any larger than that, and people start to get a bit lost somewhere in, in the ether. So I like to keep, keep it between six and eight. Um, so I go right back and then it's a class list. And unfortunately, you have to allocate those students by uh, by hand. And there, there, there is no other way of doing it at the moment. You just have to get on and do that. Um, so it takes a bit of time to think about the number of groups that you need and 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 setting those groups up but once it's done it's done so um it, it's it's worthwhile doing that and that's one of the things i'll talk about a little bit later on but it, it is it is a bit labor intensive to start off with but then say so once it's done you, you you don't have to do that again so that's what we do with those um and that's worked say really well to the point where you know, students have wanted to stay in the same groups for the future. And it's going to be interesting to see how that dynamic works over the whole year, because we're only now just ensuring that in future students are going to be in the same groups. So with the, the actual channel activities, um, I always start at the beginning of the module when they've just gone into their groups and I'll do an icebreaker and it'll be something like, um, you know, find out something that you all have in common that's not to do with your job or the university. Um, so that at least that gets them talking and they're starting to find out a bit about each other. And I will run that activity again after about after about four sessions and say, right, what else have you found out about each other now? So so that works quite well. Um, I encourage them to meet and to discuss things. Um, they can either do it in chat or they can do it actually meeting again with, with webcams so that they, they get to get that rapport. They start to understand each other and they start to find a way of working because that's something we, we can't do remotely. We can't make people work in a certain way. And one of the nice things now about the, 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 the channels is that if students have a hearing impairment or if they have dyslexia, because it's a smaller group, it's less of a problem. And we, we can make sure that they, those people get, get that support, but that the others in the group understand. Just to clarify, is the assignment submitted to the group or for teaching purposes? It can be either. And I'm going to be talking about assignments a little bit later on because they we, we, we trialed something this semester for an assignment using the, 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 the private channels, which worked really, really well. Not necessarily the way that we thought it would, but it nevertheless worked really, really well. Um, and then the other thing is it's a safe space for asking questions. And it doesn't matter, or I've, I've found in my experience, it doesn't matter how many times the students ask questions. Um, also, you, you tell the student there's no such thing as a stupid question. Please ask the question, because if you don't understand, somebody else won't. They don't like to do it in such a, such a large public forum because they think they're stupid. So that's um, that, that, that's worked really, re really well within those private channels because it's their private safe area. So the next thing I do is to set up the class notebook, which is the collaborative space. So there are, there are three parts to the, the class notebook. So you've got the content library, which is where you can put all the teaching materials. And actually, I tend not to do that in the content library because I find the files section, which is sort of, I, I suppose, the SharePoint type of section, is actually easier to put everything. And all the students know that everything is there. As a university, we have Blackboard, and all of our student materials have to go on Blackboard so I, I put them there, but the actual files that the students use generally will be will be in Teams because it, once again, it keeps it all within one, within one space. You then get the student notebooks and they are individual notebooks 
that only the students and I can see or, or any other instructor can see. And that's where they can do work for feedback. We'll talk about that in a little bit of time. They can take class notes. Um, and that, that's, that's their space where they can keep all of their work. And that work can be saved. It can be downloaded afterwards as a PDF so that, or, or copied to a personal notebook so that they have that permanent record. And that works particularly well, I think, for portfolios. And then we have the collaboration space, and that's the bit that I use all the time with them. So that collaboration space, what I will do is, so I create a collaboration space for each session that, that I'm doing with them. Um, the very first thing I do is in, in any session space is the attendance register because I routinely forget to download the attendance register. I, I for, for some reason, it's never on my radar. Don't don't know why. So I get them to fill in an attendance register. Um, so that's a that that's that works really well. Now, there are two different ways that I use um, the class notebook collaboration space, which is this bit on the right. And I'll show you it's a little bit bigger. The first time I get them to use this collaborative space, I give them a template to complete rather than them working on something freestyle, which re requires a little bit more um, lateral thinking on their behalf, if you like. So I put something in place. Um, and you know the, the nice thing about class notebook is you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. You can copy from uh, for, for, from other pages and from other sections and from other notebooks, so that you don't have to carry on doing everything. So that's the first type. The second type is much more freestyle, and um, as the students are working in it, the easiest thing here always is a nice. I have to remind myself to have, a, have a, a post it note on my screen going, remind them to open it in browser. If they open it in the browser, they get a much, much bigger version of it. And then it's easier for them to see that they can put anything they like anywhere on that page. So this one that you're looking at here, they are looking at and, and actually we, we, we turned it into a game. Um, so they are looking at different types of evidence. So I've given each group different types of um, research uh, methodology to look at. So this is bias. Somebody else looks at another group looks at credibility and so on. So the idea is that they they're going to come back to the session and they are going to um, say what what bias is and why it's the most important critical issue to look at when you're looking at um, research for evaluation purposes. So they, they can all work in that space at the same time. And if it, it's, it, I find it quite remarkable, really, that you can have all this, all this work going on. You've got five, five or six people in different places, but they're all coming together on one page. So it's as if they're in the classroom, but they're not. So the other things, that, that there are lots of other things that you can do. If, if you click on the class notebook, icon you can do things like review student work so when you've set it and obviously sorry about the black marks but obviously i can't let you see the student names and you can see one right at the bottom um, so i've set it up so that they've got areas where they can um, take class notes i've put in all the different assignments and this here is a list of different assignments if I were to click on one of those, it would give me a list of students who had wanted feedback on their work. There's no point in me doing that now because it, it's all finished. But it allows you then to go in and look at the different sections um, and give feedback on the work that they've done. There's another way of doing that, and I will be explaining that in a little while. So that's where you can start to collaborate between the students and, and you. So they can ask a question in there. I can give them feedback. I can ask them questions. I can give them suggestions. And that's all within their set space. So the other thing I can do is um, I offer students one-to-ones um, -one um, on one of the assignments that I give them over the course of the module. And using um, 
word or, 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 or form as you, you, you can use either. I can, I can upload that to here and then the students can simply fill in their names. And it, when I discovered that I could do this, it revolutionized my life because it meant I didn't have to go through emails or Teams messages. The students simply put in what date and time they want and that becomes an automatic process. I am now changing that to a formal booking form in Teams because that will come now come through automatically to my calendar. But at least it means, say, that I've got a complete list of students and I can see who hasn't made a one-to-one -one appointment with me and chase them up if necessary. So I was talking about feedback um, be before and um, the assignments tab, which is, is at the top, is to, to me a complete misnomer because assignments here in Teams isn't linked to our gradebook at all. I'm so sorry. So sorry. Oh! Sorry, just throwing my phone out. I thought it was off. Um, where was I? Yes, so I do wish, and if Microsoft ever listened to this, I, and I have put a request through, to allow us to change the, the titles of the tabs, because assignment is a complete mis misnomer. And if you don't explain it really carefully to the students, they don't understand what this is either. So this doesn't link for us to grades per se, but I use it for two things. I use it for feedback, so the students can upload their work, and then it's got an actual section of um, for my feedback. It gives me a list of who's submitted, and it also, and then I can also see who hasn't. And the students can submit more than once if you're happy for them to do it. The other thing I do are quizzes, just 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 to check their knowledge. Um, some students do it, some students don't. I have some modules where they all religiously do the quizzes. Um, this module, as you can see, they weren't so happy, but almost all of them came to me for feedback. Um, and that's worked, that's worked really, really well. And it sort of made it a more, I suppose, a more formal process for them than doing it in the class notebook. But I think it depends on what you're doing with them. Um, but that's so that there's the two different ways. And to be honest, they both work really pre pretty well. But I've, I've really come to love assignments now. I just wish I could call it something else. And that's the second tab, and I don't know why we've got that twice. Right, so one of the things which always worried me about the class notebook was not being able to see who had done what. So it wasn't clear whether one student was doing all the work in the group. I was aware that there are some students, so the platform used for the class notebook, it is, it is OneNote it, in, in, in the way that it works. It is completely OneNote, but it sits within Microsoft Teams. And um, if you are going to use the class notebook and Teams, it's really, really important to set that class notebook up within the Teams environment, because if you set them up separately, you can't put them together afterwards. Um, so that that's a real, um, yes, that's, but that's something that's one of my in summary make sure you do it all in one place so what you if, if you then go to um, open in browser um, and you can see it show authors and then which I, i'm obviously i've had to put black marks but then you can actually see which students have done which piece of work within that class notebook activity so that really that's really helped now we, we couldn't do that for a long time and that is real I'm, I'm feeling much more relaxed now you know there are the, there are groups of students and i do i do allow them to work the way that they want to work the way that they feel they work best um, so there are some students who just want to talk there are some students who are quite happy doing the writing and there are some students who are quite happy just going off and doing the research part of it um, so I don't designate what those tasks are. I think if I was teaching 
undergrads more, I probably would. But certainly for my master's students, postgrads, I tend not to do that. Um, and I do think that by giving them that, the option of the way in which they want to work makes it a far more accessible tool because everybody can use it. The other thing that we have within Teams um, is what's called insights. Um, and so that, that's at the top and that's just a, a, a downloadable, downloadable app that you can use. And this measures the activity of, of any potential st of event, any student um, with, within Teams. So this, for example, we used for undergrads um, this last year, we, or this last semester, as part of their learning outcome, we asked them to discuss certain questions in their groups. Um, and one of the very first ways that we could look at the amount of activity that they'd done within that was to see the number of posts. So we've got some people who across the three questions, he'd done 58 or 55. There were other students who'd done three. Um, now, whilst that doesn't, you know, the, the, the three, you, you'd, go and, you'd go and look, you'd pick some at random. But so if, if a student had only done three, I'd go and look at those three posts because they might have been three exceptional posts rather than just I, I agree. And the 58 could be, yeah, tick, I like, or I, I agree. So some, you, you have to be a bit careful, but it gives you a very reasonable idea and you can customise the range totally. So, so if you wanted to look at what a particular student was doing on a particular week, which I had to do recently for a student who's doing an apprenticeship, I could say this, this, this was their activity for that week. So I could actually prove that they, they had actually, because I could track everything through Teams, they had actually been there, they had actually been engaging. So that uh, takes a bit of getting used to, but once you are, it works really, really well. So that, that has really helped. So the next thing I wanted, wanted to talk about really was the, the collaboration between the student and us, I suppose. And one of the ways that I like to do that is through module evaluation. Um, now I do a, oh, sorry. I do a, form oh okay for some reason that's in the wrong place let me just go so i do a evaluation rather than it being mid module at that mid module or at the end i do a running um, evaluation so i start off right at back at the beginning and i encourage the students to come all anonymous to come back on a regular basis and say i like this i didn't like that this worked this didn't work and then i can look at that and decide if things immediately have to change because something's not working for for whatever reason um, or whether it's something i need to explain so last semester i had students we, we, we did a session on something that they weren't going to be assessed on at the end of the module um, and there were several people who were like well we wasted the whole time blah, 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 blah. and i was going to say but you still need to know about it for the future. We might not be assessing it, but it's something essential that you need to know about. And then they were all fine. One note class notebook, yes, but, but they, they, they work in very, very much the same way that the, that, that one note and then the class notebook. Um, so if, if you've used one, you can use the other one because the principles are exactly the same. So I wanted to go back to, there we are. There are other apps which work seamlessly and beautifully. You can have them in tabs at the top so they're actually embedded within Teams. I routinely use VVox and we will create word clouds. I will, um, we, you know, I will ask them questions and get them to vote on things. Um, and I will also check their knowledge at the end. Um, and last semester, I did a question and answer with them where um, I was checking that they knew what it was that the final assignment was actually all about. And that, that worked quite well. 
Flipgrid, I do use Flipgrid. I don't routinely use it because I know that really an awful lot of students really, really don't like that the video element of it. Once they get into it, they're fine, but it's that initial, it's rather like me and Sway. I have a, a have a I used to have a big thing about Sway because I don't find it intuitive and I have to work really, really hard at it. Once I got to grips with it, it was fine. Um, so Flipgrid, I tend to use Flipgrid for my overseas students who are never going to be on campus. They are all over the world and they are all having to interact with the materials at different times. So I never, it's extremely rare that I would ever have them all actually in one place at one time, all bit through a screen. So I get them to do introductions about themselves so that they can see each other's faces and, and they know what they're interested in. And that's quite nice. Wakelet is another one, um, and that's quite nice if students are trying to collect things together, especially if they're, they're doing portfolios or they want to get a group of resources together. And then there's web links. I always um, put a link back to Blackboard so that they don't have to leave Teams and go to Blackboard. They can just click on the link in Blackboard. I try to avoid using too many things because the students get confused. Um, and I, I do think that sometimes we can be really guilty of using some of this digital stuff just for the sake of using it when we really don't need to. And what the students need is something that's absolutely stable and that they're confident with how to use it. And you have that confidence in how to use it because there is nothing worse. And I, and I know this now from the students who, who have finish with me there is nothing worse than them listening to you going oh I'm really sorry that's not working and, and um, we need we need to have, we need to be, we need to give them that confidence that you know what you're doing as well now some of them don't mind and I think it's easier with the the students who've never had the classroom um, experience they are much more forgiving when things don't work um, or when you go, I'm really sorry, I, I can't make, yeah, I, I don't know what I've done here. Much more forgiving. The other students really, really, really didn't like that. So there's all those things, but these are embedded in Teams. And um, that means the students have one space, they don't have to go off to anywhere else. And it, it's, it makes them feel much more comfortable, much more secure in, in that environment so they can get to know it really well. So we did the module evaluation. Ah, I'd be interested in hearing how you see Blackboard fitting. Yes. Well, <laughs> um, let, before I do the summary, yes, I, I think um, to me, to be perfectly honest, the only reason I would now I would use Blackboard now is for um, the actual assignments, and all of our assignments have to go in through Turnitin. So we're sort of we have to have something that we can run Turnitin. Now, my understanding is that Turnitin is going to be available through Teams at some point. Um, I think that's actively being worked on. Once that is done that way, then to me, as, as, a, as a module leader and as a student, because I've been a student at UCLan as well, it would become an irrelevance because everything, everything that my students need so they're the module descriptors, the student handbooks, the academic procedures, everything can be within Teams. So I'm not, I, I don't know, uh, I don't know how much longer it's going to go on having to have Blackboard and Teams and making the students toggle between the two. Because I, I don't make them toggle between the two anymore, except for submitting that assignment. So in summary, really, you know, the, 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 the peer support is so essential for them and anything that we can do which helps them to generate that, that comfort and that, that feeling that they have friends that they can talk to about it all. Um, ask those questions, say, sit there and go, I don't understand what I'm doing. Anything that we can do is, is good. And, and I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled in, in January to discover that I'd, I'd, for whatever reason, I'd gone off to the module from last year and um, there was a meeting going on. And I'm like, 
what? Oh, you know, oh no, they've left it on all this time. So I went to it and no, they were actually meeting. So they were meeting as a group about another module. So they kept that group. Um, so that, that had worked so, so well. Collaboration, those templates or the freestyle, um, you know, it gives them that, that space and it's a permanent record. And for, from our point of view, when they are presenting or discussing what they have found, you can actually share that full, full screen with all the other students. So, you know, you, you and all the other students can see that as well. Their work can be downloaded as a PDF or it can be transferred to their own notebook. So it's always there. They're never going to lose it. There are all those apps with, which work within Teams, so that interaction is completely seamless. And then Insights allow you to track that individual student interaction. It's not perfect, but I don't think any system is ever going to be perfect. Um, but I, and I think a lot of this comes down to you getting to know your students, which is more difficult through a screen, but not, not I, I do I do one to ones and, and so on. I do workshop assign, assignment workshops. That's sort of, so you get you get to know the students. But it's just perhaps a, a warning if, if students are not engaging um, or are appearing not to engage. There are you know, there are always the lurkers, as they're called, the people who prefer to just sit back and listen. And if they're OK with that, then that's not a problem, providing other people in the group are not starting to get a bit fed up and feeling as though they're having to do more work and this other person isn't. So, so there are group dynamics, but it, it does work really well. And then the main thing, so there are two things really, I don't know why that one's at the end of that sentence, but never, never mind. Invest the time in setting it up from the start and giving students time to learn how to use it. And that takes far longer than you think it's going to. Um, but it's worth it's worth making that time um, and then talking the students through face to face and not assuming that they're going to watch a video or learn how to use it in advance because they won't. Or that's 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 certainly my experience. Um, you know, a lot of my students work full time, which is why I don't give them too much to do outside of the sessions. So a lot of them work full time and they just don't have time. Same with staff. Yes, it, yes, it is. In time. Indeed, a lot of the time, exactly the same with staff. They're not going to look at it in advance. And I know as a digital coach, I've said, well, well, we'll have a look at this. Have a look and see what you think. And they never have done. Oh, I didn't have the time. So, yes, it, it's exactly the same with staff. And then the other thing is really to set everything up from within one space. And I can't I say this all the time. And if Chris Melia was here, he would be laughing out loud. If you're going to use Teams and the class notebook, set the class notebook up within the team, not separately, because you can set it up separately. You cannot import a class notebook into a team once it's set up. So, you know, this is this is something that I've worked really hard at doing. Everything I use sits within one space and they much the students much prefer that. And you know, it's not just my word. I, I have some some and these are real, real quotes from, from students. Um, you know, it does work well. There are days when the software doesn't work and it's no good. Some, sometimes it just doesn't. I had a real issue with BVOX this morning. Ninety nine times out of 100. It's absolutely fine. You need to create the right type of team to get the class notebook. Ours, um, because of the way that it's set up, we um, it's always the right team for for, for notebook, fortunate class notebook, fortunately. But yes, and you're you're absolutely right. There are different types of teams that you can set up. So you can set up a stuff notebook. That, that there are different types of teams, but this this is the one for students, um, and that will always give you the um, the ability to set up the class notebook. That's not to say that you have to. I would recommend Teams for everybody anyway. And my my email inbox. Do you know what? It's really interesting. My email inbox recently has started racking up again, and the Teams messages have started going down. And I and I I don't know why that is. Um, and I'm sort of starting to think I'm going to put a message on my email to go. Please message me in Teams. Don't send me an email. But anyway. Um, 
so that's um i think out of all of this what i what my biggest pleasure thrill was those students continuing to use that private channel for work from a different module because they didn't have that set up in a different module and that's to me to, honestly it just said it all i had this sort of warm glow of like oh that worked <laughs> um so you know that's that's what i would always say it's worth making the effort because the students do use it and they do appreciate it so that's me um, I am very happy for any of you to contact me if you have any questions about what we're doing with Teams um, or what I'm doing with Teams and also about the DigiLearn sector, um, which is based at UPlan, um, but is now a, it's becoming quite national. Um, so that's, I'm finished with 10 minutes to spare. So if anybody has any questions, I will be very, very happy to answer them. What an absolutely fantastic presentation. And just while we're waiting for maybe people to type out their um, questions, I'm sure you can all find the clap emoji um, to say a massive well done to Jane for that. But if you do have any questions, feel free to raise your hand. Um, uh, you do have the mic function enabled. There we go, Neil. Hi, Neil. Hi. Uh, hello, yeah, that's great. I'm doing a similar thing. Uh, this year with with the module um, but I, was, I was just so it's really helpful to get to, to get that insight uh, first uh, to learn from your experience um, I, I'm gonna have about probably 250 students I was just wondering how many students you have on this module um, and did you allocate the groups randomly did you get any students who were really like wanted to swap groups or anything like that did you get any was there anything around that which sort of caused you a bit of a headache, as it were? Um, to, to be honest, no. What, what I tend to do, as I say, it, it's the size of the groups that I think are absolutely critical. Um, I actually normally just allocate them in alphabetical order because it seems as good a way as any. Um, and... Um, I, yeah, I, I, so I tend to just do alphabetical order. What I do do, however, though, is if I've got somebody with any sort of impairment or, or disability, I will contact them to see if there's anybody else they know within within the who's doing the, the module at the same time, so that I can put them together, so that they because that person then can support and understands what the issue is. So I will put somebody with impairment with somebody that they know. If there isn't, um, then I will get permission to contact somebody who's going to be in that group to explain what the position is and just ask them to, to make sure that everything's all right within that group. But I've not actually so far, but of course, we're, we're only really coming towards the end of semester two and this is why we're all learning and it's all it's it is still new um i've not had a student asked to move groups yet um so uh that's that's not been a problem so far i do know that a colleague did have that question um because a girl wanted to, she'd been used to her particular group and for some reason she'd been moved into another group for a different model and she wanted to move. And he, he'd had to say no um, for, for, for very valid reasons. But it's like I said before, we're now going to make sure that those groups remain the same throughout. I think if there was a real issue with a certain member of a group, then we would have to address that. As, as it came up but I've not had a problem so far you know 250 that's that's quite a lot to manage within within one team space I've managed sort of a hundred odd before now um, and that's not that's that's been that's been okay it, it's getting it set up once it's set up it doesn't really matter how many students you've got I don't think it's getting it set up in the first place. So obviously you're gonna to have to sit there and you're gonna to have to input those 250 names into the various groups manually. But and at the moment, there's no way, I, I know that it's something that Microsoft are actually looking at, at trying to streamline in some way, but there's no, there is no other option at the moment. 
Yeah, you can't even use a CSV file, which is really annoying. <laughs> Does that help? Yeah, thanks very much. That's okay. uh, absolutely great. Um, yeah, that's a brilliant. Thank you. Really appreciate you. Uh, okay. but... <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. I mean, if you know, Neil, if, if, if you do want to talk through anything, just honestly, just ping me a message and I'd be very, very happy to talk through, you know, a, a, anything else. Because you say you're going through setting it up now, you know, and I know the mistakes that I made first of all. Um, and, and, you know, we, we, that's what we all learn from, isn't it? But you Absolutely. don't want to make a comparison with 250 students, frankly, because I thought setting that up again would be a bit miserable. <laughs> yeah. There's another question actually, which uh, is quite relevant. Um, Susan asks about uh, booking sessions in the diary. Like, that's something else I'd like to sort of systemize as much as possible, you know, yeah. so you don't get students just randomly um, contact, contacting you. And yeah. if there's any shared questions, like if there's any, how do you help the students support each other as well? Like, so you mentioned about the groups. Um, sort of help you know they can contact each other and stuff and discuss yeah. but just so not everyone's not just asking you everything they can ask each other I'd be exactly. exactly that's that's what that's what I encourage them to do um and um you know if they're feeling really brave they can ask the question in in, in the general channel um if they're not so brave they can ask it within their private channel and what I do periodically is that I'll have a skim through. And if, if there's a question that I think the whole group would benefit from, from me answering, then I'll, I'll go into the general channel and I'll say, oh, this question was raised. This is the answer. Um, so it's just a case of, of keeping an eye on it. But generally, um, you know, they actually work. They actually work most of it out together in their groups. Um, but once again, are, are you um, postgrad or undergrad? Uh, it's undergrad. Yeah, I, I think maybe they need a little bit more, a little bit more support, I suppose, I think, than the postgrads who seem to be much, much happier to try and agree something between themselves or, or, or decide on a way forward. Whereas I think the undergrads do tend to um, have quite a large group um earlier on this this year um who you know if i said to them evaluate this paper using this evaluation grid no i couldn't get that <laughs> um so, so sometimes i think they need a bit more support a bit more input um but i would i would strongly suggest saying to them you know ask 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 your peers first don't or don't always come to me and and i have in the past said to a student you know have, have, have you asked the others in the group um, but you know they, these we, we all know that students don't even read half the time um you know the, the messages that are already in the general channel you know where do i get this from well i posted that about four posts up go and have a look you know um but i i, I think it's um i i tend Oh, I don't think I molly coddle them. I think I could probably give them more support because it's not in the classroom. And, I, and I'm I'm conscious that they are all, you know, in, in different places um, alone. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'd probably give them a bit more support, but I try really hard to do that encouragement. To, to, to actually do it with, with their peers. Why don't you ask that? It's a really great question. Why don't you ask it in the general channel or why don't you ask it in your own private channel? Cool, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. <laughs> Excellent. I think we are coming up to time. Does anybody have any last questions for Jane? Not that I can see, nobody's raising their hands. In that case then, Jane, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just stop